Dear students, it is time to discuss everyone's favorite topic to hate, and that is taxes. So we start with a few quotes from some famous dead people. In this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Benjamin Franklin, the statesman, the inventor, the author, and the individual probably most responsible for the colonies becoming the United States of America. Why is that? Because Mr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, was instrumental in getting the other superpower of the time, France, on the side of the colonies. He was very popular in France. Taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., a Civil War veteran and one of the longest-serving Supreme Court judges. You want to live in a civilized society? You're going to pay taxes. And then lastly, only the little people pay taxes. Leona Helmsley, hotel owner, fashion designer, prison inmate, convicted tax felon. Yes, dear students, somewhere along the line, you're going to stumble upon an internet site or see some crackpot, I mean, some individual in the parking lot of the Walmart screaming and hollering that taxes are voluntary, taxes are unconstitutional, you don't have to pay your taxes. You know, there are three branches of our government. Actually, there's a fourth, but it's not an official branch. There's the legislature that makes the laws. There's the executive branch that executes the laws. And then there's the judicial branch that interprets the laws. And all the judges and all the courts in the United States of America have said that no, taxes are not unconstitutional. You do have to pay your taxes. The fourth as state, as it is sometimes called, is the press. And oh my goodness, is it in a sorry state of, of, uh, of being. But still, that's how we keep this thing afloat. And um, as Mr. F Dr. Franklin said when he was asked, what, what, what kind of government, after they, had, after they had put together the Constitution, what kind of government do we have, Dr. Franklin? It's a republic, ma'am if you can keep it. And uh, he was very prescient. <laughs> can we keep the Republic? Well, we have some serious issues these days, whether or not we're going to continue to be a democracy. Uh, so stay tuned for continuing developments. Slide to number two. About one third of each dollar that you earn as a citizen is going to taxes. And that's why we hear people say that May Day is now Tax Freedom Day, because that's one third into the year. And uh, so the first four months, January, February, March, and April, you've been paying taxes to the government. And now you continue, now you can have the rest of the money for yourself from May to December. Well, it's actually not May, depending on who you are. Uh, it's usually a lot earlier than that for the vast majority of us. But still, the idea is that you have a partner in this life. Uh, you have Uncle Sam and Uncle Cal, <laughs> California, uh, who, you know, want to be paid because they're producing goods and services for you. Those aircraft carriers that float by, the freeways that you drive on, the police department, the fire department, the hospitals, the schools, the... Yes, yeah, so um, they, they, they want their due. Understanding tax rules and regulations can help you reduce your tax liability. To help you cope with many types of taxes, you should know the current tax laws as they affect you, which is somewhat of what we're going to do in these three presentations. We're not going to make you a tax uh, preparer. Make purchase and investment decisions that reduce your tax liability. But be careful! Not all tax-advantaged investments are good values, especially for the working class. An example of this are municipal bonds that are really great for high net worth, high income individuals, but eh, not so great for the vast majority of us working grunts. And 
maintain your tax records. And um, if you haven't done the um, goal, the, the non-financial goal for, uh, or yeah, I guess it could be considered a financial goal, but for chapter one, a good non-financial goal or goal just in general would be to uh, organize your tax records and other uh, financial records. Slide number three. There are four times types of taxes. Purchases, ta sales tax, and excise tax, and other um, taxes such as that when you buy tires or, or in, uh, electronics, you buy, buy an environmental fee tax. Taxes on property. Most people, if uh, want to have a home someday, you're going to pay property taxes. And then the personal property tax, the vast majority of us pay that when we register our motor vehicle. Taxes on wealth. This used to be the major form of taxes, but now it affects a very small number of people. But, you know, 2,000 years ago, when you um, uh, were taxed, you would tithe when the government and the religion were basically one and the same. And that is why sometimes you hear still uh, about tithing. Uh, you gave a tenth of your wealth to the government, which was also the religion at the time. And if you didn't do that, they tied you to a pole and whipped you. And that's why tax collectors were considered the lowest of the low, very... Um, very uh, uh, un undesirable individuals in biblical times. And that's why they crucified Jesus, because he was very kind to the two worst considered individuals of the time, tax collectors and women. So uh, there you go. Now, uh, the one we're going to spend our most time on are taxes on earnings, income tax. And that's the, that's the one that for the most, for the, for most of us, once we've entered the middle class, that's the one that's going to hit us the hardest. There is a fifth type of tax called uh, Social Security, Medicare, sometimes called payroll taxes. Technically, they're, they're contributions to a retirement system and a medical system for retirees, but we're going to think of them as taxes. And when you earn income, uh, you pay 6.2% to Social Security, 1.45% to Medicare. But if you're self-employed, you pay almost twice this amount. Why? Because I know you don't like your boss. He's a jerk, whatever. But every time they pay you, your company that you work for, they are also paying into Social Security and Medicare. If you're self-employed, you're your own boss. So you need to um, pay that. It's not twice as much. It's almost twice as much. And there's a few little few little uh, wrinkles about how that's just calculated and we won't get into that but if you do or if you are interested at all uh, and, and in our next presentation we're going to learn how to do a, a typical uh, uh, return for a homeowner if you are at all interested in becoming or in getting involved in tax uh, tax world we have a phenomenal program now hopefully it will be resurrected COVID gave it the deep six but it's called VITA, or VITA, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. And you, dear students, can be taught for free how to do taxes. You get a certificate, and you can get college credit. Now, what's the catch? They want you to volunteer for at least, that's why it's called the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. You, they want you to volunteer for at least 40 hours from Jan February till April. I did it one year when I was on sabbatical. I had a blast. And so think about it. And you get college credit. Very cool. It looks great on your resume. And it could be a, it could be a career. Uh, very cool. And we have a, an accounting class uh, in ta prep, tax preparation, which is also very cool. So think about it, folks. Think about it. The industry needs you. And folks, you'll never be out of work if you get involved in the tax world. Uh -huh. Slide number five. How much does it really cost? Now, this is a calculation that's relatively simple. And there's a, there's a worksheet that we want you to do. And it really does make you think about your purchases. We're going to discuss purchases in detail in Chapter 6. But, but we said that, you know, 
spend less than you earn, live beneath your means, pay yourself first. This is the one thing that will help you think about that next purchase. You go into Worst Buy, I'm sorry, Best Buy, and um, you buy a stereo or whatever it is, $299. And um, you walk out of the door, you pay the person $299. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to pay state sales tax. You might have to pay an environmental fee on top of that, but let's forget it for now. So that means, you know, depending on where you are in the county, about 8%. So that's an extra $23.92. So your out-of-pocket expense when you left the store was $322.92. Okay, is that how much it cost you? Well, it depends. <laughs> if somebody gave you that money, yeah, that's your total cost. But if you had to earn it, and you folks who collect a paycheck know exactly what I'm talking about, before you've gotten that $322.92, money was taken out of your paycheck. And this depends on what's called your marginal tax rate, which is a kind of a tricky thing to, to figure out, but you better do it because it's going to be with us for the rest of the semester. Uh, how much did we have to pay in taxes before we received that $322.92? Well, if we're in the 22% tax bracket, and many people, once they reach the middle class and are trading their life for their paycheck and the paycheck for the mortgage or rent payment and the orthodontia and the, and the, and the, and the, and the kids' karate lessons and the car payment, they're in the 22% tax bracket. So that meant $112.14 went to the feds. And if you're in the 7% state income tax bracket, which doesn't actually exist it, that's straddling the 6 and the 8% because the tax brackets in California and federal are different. So let's just say 7%. That meant you had to pay $35.68 to the state of California. Now, you didn't actually write a check to them. They took it out of your paycheck. So your out-of-pocket and income taxes were over $470. But wait a minute. You also had to pay Social Security and Medicare. And that 7.65%, that's $39. So that $299 stereo actually cost you $509.74. Do you think about that when you make that purchase? No, well, not until today. But <laughs> from now on, will you think about it when you make that purchase? And say yes. Nod your head yes. Oh, I can see. Oh, good. Very good. See? I can see you nodding your head, yes. So that's why we say uh, spend less than you earn. Think about those purchases. Think about how much it's really costing you before you make that purchase for that thing that you didn't even know existed, but you just saw it on television five minutes ago, and now you can't live without it. And so you buy it and put it in the closet where it goes next to all the other things that you couldn't live without. Here's the calculation, and it's a very simple calculation. You take the out-of-pocket expense, which means the price plus any sales tax, plus any environmental taxes that you might be hit, excise taxes and the like, and you divide it by one minus the marginal tax bracket. Now, here's the bugaboo. Everybody's marginal tax rate is different. The more money you make, the higher it gets. Ah, we'll see that in the next presentation. It's called a progressive tax system. So let's say we're in the 22% federal bracket, 7% state bracket, and then don't forget Social Security and Medicare. We add those puppies up, and then don't forget to subtract by one. Now, what is that one? It's actually 100%. I mean, it doesn't matter how you write it, but that's what the one is, 100%. And so on your calculator, don't put 22, put 0.22. Don't put 0.7, put 0.07 por ciento. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, take 22 and divide it by 100. That's what percent means, por ciento, by 100. And after you do that calculation, you find out that that $299 stereo actually cost you $509.74. Now, these problems will be on the exam. So do the worksheet. And here in the face-to-face -face class, we would stop, pass out the worksheets, and, and work them together. 
but you have to do that on your own. But no, you don't because I've done the, I have the answer key there. We have the answer key. We have a commentary for you to do. And so do these a few times and you'll realize they're very, very simple once you've done them a few times. Okay, and of course, if you have any questions, you know who to contact. Don't forget the office hours that are posted. I'll have at least uh, five or six. I forget. They might have changed it on us. Five, I think they're paying this for. But I'll, I'll set a time anytime. You want, to, you want to contact me? Contact me. We'll make a time for you. Okay. Now, we're going to prepare. We're not going to do it yet. That's our next presentation. But we're going to prepare filing our federal income tax. First of all, do you have to file? Well, you should. Even if you don't have to, you should. Anybody in 2021, now the 2022 tax forms haven't come out yet, so uh, you know we'll, we'll deal with that later on. But uh, anybody in 2021 who made $12,550 single, or if they're married, made $25,100 or more, and then there's you know, how head of household and the like, they have to file. You're required to file. Now, if you don't, if you make less than that, you don't have to file, but you should. Why? Because if you had any money taken out of your uh, paychecks, even if you didn't make that much money, if you don't file, they're not going to send it to you. They're not going to say, hey, they're not going to call you up and say, hey, Fred, hey, uh, you, you didn't file, but you we got a couple hundred dollars here. You want us to send it to you? They're not going to do that, all right? You have to file to get your hundred dollars or 200 or 500, whatever it is back. Plus, you may depend, if you're in a lower tax bracket, lower uh, income bracket, you may qualify for the earned income credit, especially if you have children. And what is the earned income credit? Eh, kind of like a reverse income tax. We know you ain't making a whole lot of money, and we know how hard it is to make ends meet. So we're going to pay you to keep working. <laughs> you see that? It's like a reverse income tax, and it's very cool. But again, if you don't take it, are they going to call you up and say, hey, we got some money for you? No, you have to do it. And that's why the VITA, the VITA, the VUDA, whatever it's called, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program is so cool because they're computers. You just type the numbers in and bingo, it tells you, you are um, eligible for the earned income credit. So if you're not interested in uh, volunteering, at least go there and let them run your taxes just in case you are uh, eligible. Now, there are five filing status categories, single or legally separated, married filing jointly, and these are the two most popular ones. Married filing separately is not something you really ever want to do unless there are knives and court orders and po possible poisonous um, <laughs> drinks involved. Yes, if you're talking to the jerk, I mean the uh, ex- at least uh, consider doing married filing jointly. You'll probably pay fewer dollars in taxes. Head of household is for people who uh, typically have a child uh, and they're single parent. Now, be careful. Both parents cannot claim head of household. And if you do, it'll take the IRS a while. They work slowly, especially after being gutted by the previous president. But they're going to be <laughs> beefed up now, our understanding is. And they'll eventually send you a letter, official business only, saying, you goofed, you can't both be head of household, work it out. And then if your spouse passed away within, I think, the last two years, I think that's it, they give you two years, then you can be, you can be considered married still, even though you're now a single person, you're a widow or a widower. So those are the people who must file, and those are the categories. Now, which tax record should you keep? Well... I just say keep all of it personally, but the IRS tells you to keep your tax forms, the instruction booklets, uh, previous years, your social security numbers, the W-2 forms from your employers, any 1099 forms, which are money that was paid to you, and 1098 forms, the mortgage that you paid, receipts, documents, investment, business expenses. I say keep it all, folks. How long should you keep it? That's a good question. The IRS says three days from the date of the return, the date the return was due or filed, or two day, two years, I say three days, I'm sorry, three years from the date the return was due or filed, or two years from the date the tax was paid, whichever is longer. 
But then the IRS also goes on to say that you should keep some records longer, but they don't say which records or how long, and they don't say how, which records they don't say how long. So I say, thanks a lot, guys. I keep them forever. Now, having said that, some people who worked at the IRS when I told them that I still had records going back to, you know, dating back to, uh, I don't even want to say, but uh, the 1980s, they just kind of laughed and they said, no, 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 you don't have to keep them that long. They said, after 10 years, there's just no way that anything's going to go. But I don't actually necessarily believe them. I don't necessarily believe them because we know a person wasn't the IRS that came after him. It was the state of California. 10 years afterwards, they were coming after him for some coming after them for something that was totally bogus. And if she hadn't kept her records, what would she have done? Very good question. So I don't have a good, a good answer. I keep them forever. Now, we have these boxes and boxes of records, and I, we got them in this shed, and if it ever caught on fire, oh well, what are we going to do? And every year, I think, okay, let's get the scanner out and scan all these things, and then send them through the shredder. And then I go lie down and take a nap. <laughs> but hey, you know, what are you gonna do? So I say, keep them forever. I think I'm being very um, overly cautious, but I don't wanna know anybody at the IRS on a first name basis. I did know somebody on a very intimate basis my mother, before she passed away, who worked at the IRS for many years and would always complain, nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> she happened to work at the IRS office that lost 45,000 returns one year. Oops, <laughs> where'd they go? We don't know, probably got shredded. So, uh, you know, they're people, they make mistakes, sort of, kind of. And um, I don't know what to tell you. I wish I had a good answer. Okay, last slide for today is a discussion of the Republican tax cuts of 2017. The landmark bill, the only one, that was pushed through Congress in uh, Trump's time, uh, introduced many changes to the tax code. Some changes were politically devices and divisive and hurt, pot intentionally hurt states that were primarily, primarily Democratic, such as California and New York. and um, uh, Chicago and high uh, tax areas, high income areas, the metropolitan areas. It's unbelievable that they did this, uh, but they did. The tax cuts went overwhelmingly to the rich. Estimates range from 62 to 83 percent. The cuts go to those in the top one percent. It will increase the federal budget. Initial estimates were ranged from a, uh, a half a half a trillion to one and a half trillion dollars. Now it appears it will act, add approximately $4 trillion before 2025 if things aren't changed, which doesn't look like they will. The corporate tax cuts that were implemented are permanent. <laughs> permanent. But the individual tax cuts phase out after the eight years uh, of the, uh, the 2025 when, when, it, when it disappears. By 2027, approximately 53% of individuals will pay more taxes than they did in 2017. So you can tell all the protestations to the contrary, this was a tax cut for the rich. Oh, by the way, the corporate rates were slashed from 37% to 21%. Corporations had a huge windfall, which they disproportionately gave to their shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. Dear students, it pays to be rich. What can I say? We don't make this stuff up. We just call them as we see them. And I have to tell you that in, in my humble opinion, in my, in my situation, we were helped because of various um, stock holdings that we had. But it was overwhelmingly the wealthy, very wealthy, who... Um, who benefited. I remember the, uh, the, the Fox News and the other Republicans and the Republicans uh, yelling about how I think AT&T gave their workers a thousand dollar bonus one year 
didn't didn't raise their 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 work their pay like they like it was supposed to happen. He just gave him a thousand dollar bonus, and then we're all jumping up and down, screaming about how wonderful this was. Meanwhile, the <laughs> the, the very wealthy people were saving hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars on their taxes. Okay, fine. So when we come back, dear students, bring your brain cells all exercised and 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 um, and fully uh, uh, um, relaxed. And 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 um, rested because we're going to tackle a the typical 1040 form, the typical tax return for a homeowner for homeowners. Okay, all right, dear students. Now don't don't be afraid. It's really not as hard as it sounds. It looks scary, but once you dig into it, you find that oh, this isn't that hard. Until you find something that really is, and that's when you need to call the tax accountant or the CPA. But if you just have a home with typical deductions, it isn't that hard. Okay? Okay. See you in our next presentation where we tackle a typical homeowner's tax return.